you do much praying? What have you been praying for lately? Some need you've got, or somebody, some need somebody's got that you know? Some healing you'd like to see? Some provision you'd like to see? What are you praying for lately? Well, I have some good news. There are some scriptures that say stuff like this. If such and such and so and so, you can ask for whatever you want and God will give it to you. So today, I thought after last week's message, last week's message was about Paul's encouragement to pray as a sort of a conclusion of the book of Ephesians and of the section on the armor of God, to pray in every way with all kinds of prayers and petitions about everything, to pray at all times, to pray in the Spirit, to stay alert and stay on it when it comes to prayer, to keep your eyes open and pray, to pray for everyone, for all the saints, and to pray for the words, for the bold proclamation of the gospel. So what are you praying for? Well, today I want to look at what these scriptures say about when God says yes. There are a bunch of these. There are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven that I've found so far about when God says yes. So today I'd like to give you some practical instruction about how to effectively manipulate God to get what you want. You ready? I'm only half kidding. How to manipulate God to get what you want. Because these texts say stuff like, whatever you want. So let's look at the first one. It's in Mark chapter 11, verse 22. Jesus answered them, Have faith in God. Truly I say to you, whoever says to this mountain, Be taken up and thrown into the sea, and does not doubt in his heart, but believes that what he says will come to pass, it will be done for him. Therefore I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, Believe that you've received it, and it will be yours. Now, how can he say something like that? How can he say that? So, one of the times God says yes is when we believe that he will. You believe that? You don't really believe that. I've read stories. There's a famous story about uh, Johnny Erickson Tata who uh, injured herself and was paralyzed when she was a teenager. And she went through this uh, difficult spiritual struggle with God about whether he would heal her or not. And she read this text. And she said, well, then I am going to believe that he will. I'm going to believe that he will. And she says she did. She believed as hard as she could. She's still paralyzed. (laughs) 
what on earth can he possibly mean? One of the times God says yes is when we believe he will say yes. That's kind of what this sounds like at least. I tell you, whatever you ask in prayer, believe that you have received it and it will be yours. And many people like Johnny have taken this to mean all I need to do is work up that belief. I will strive to believe. I will work to believe. I will, all I need to do is finally get to the point where I believe strong enough or well enough or whatever enough. And then God will have to say yes. Because he said he would. There's a funny thing about belief, though. You can't actually believe something unless you know it to be true. So you can't just work up belief out of thin air. Belief requires some basis, some reason to believe, some actual knowledge of what God might do. If I'm going to believe that God will say yes, uh, then I need to know something about God's intentions. You can't just believe something into existence. And so, to believe he will must include some knowledge of his will. Because God isn't actually manipulable. So, under what conditions would someone say to this mountain get in the ocean, and it would. Jesus did stuff like this, you know, in the storm. In the storm, the storm is out of any man's hands. But Jesus stands up in the boat and says, uh, all right, that's enough. The storm died. And the and the water became level. Now, Jesus is God Almighty, but I think Jesus is exercising God's power in his humanity in that instance. How does he pray and the waves obey? In fact, that's exactly the question the disciples asked. After he calmed the sea and made the storm stop, the disciples were not less afraid, they were more afraid. The scripture says now they were really afraid. They're not afraid of the storm anymore, but they're afraid of who they're dealing with here. Who can do this? Well, who can do this is the one who knows God's intention. You can't believe something unless you know something. When we believe he will, God says yes. But when does that happen? Well, here's another one. It's in Matthew chapter 18. Verse 19. Again, I say to you, and again, this is Jesus speaking. Again, I say to you, if two of you agree on earth about anything, they ask, it will be done for them by my Father in heaven. For where two or three are gathered in my name, there I am among them. When the disciples agree, God says yes. So, Yanto, I want to make us a deal, okay? Let us agree that God will give each of us a million dollars right this instant, that it's going to show up 
in our bank accounts. Will you agree? Okay, okay Yanto agreed. Lord, million dollars, please. How many of you think there's now a million dollars in my bank account? <laughs> well, that didn't work. <laughs> that didn't work. Why? Because we didn't really agree, did we? Because we know God has no reason to put a million dollars in our bank account. When the, those who are in Christ agree in Christ, then the Lord acts. But our, that agreement is not based on thin air. How do we come to agreement? Well, there's a little clue in this next verse for there are for where two or three are gathered in my name i am there whose authority is employed in this exercise well here's another one it's in james chapter 1 If any of you lacks wisdom, let him ask God, who gives generously to all without reproach, and it will be given him. The scripture says, when I ask for wisdom, God says yes. We have an example of this in scripture because when Solomon became king, God said to Solomon, tell me what you want as the new king. I'll give it to you. And Solomon said, well, what I really need as the new king is a lot of wisdom. And God generously, God gave to Solomon great wisdom, generously and without reproach. And this text says God is inclined, God says yes when people ask him for wisdom. He gives it generously. That says to me he gives more wisdom than we know we need. And he does it without reproach, no questions asked. He doesn't say, well, I don't know if I should. Well, I'll, can, let's... If, I'll tell you what, if you straighten out this little sin in your life, then I'll, no, there's no reproach. There's no questioning. He could have just said, let him ask God who gives generously and left it at that. But he didn't. He said generously and without reproach. So, if I ask God for wisdom, God gives wisdom. There's something else, though, in this text. If you're looking at it, you could read the next verse. It says, but let him ask in faith with no doubting. For the one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind that person shouldn't think he's going to receive anything from the Lord. He's a double-minded man, unstable in all his ways. Well, this reminds me of the first one, if you believe. Because it says, let him ask in faith with no doubting. The one who doubts is like a wave of the sea that is driven and tossed by the wind. Let him ask in faith. If you need wisdom, you should ask God because God, give, God is inclined to give wisdom to the people who ask him for it. He says yes to that prayer. But he says, but no doubting. 
I don't know that I've ever done anything with no doubting. But what is this about? Let him ask in faith. I think what it's about is I actually trust God as a good source of wisdom. What it means is I'm not saying, hey, God, I could really use some wisdom, so can I have your opinion so that I can evaluate that and then decide what I think is really the smart thing to do here. That's double-minded. That's not saying to the Lord, your wisdom is wisdom, period. That's saying to the Lord, I need something. You might give it to me. Let's see. Let's see if you're wisdom. So this person who asks God for wisdom is submitted to the wisdom of God in the first place. If this is a person who says, I believe that God's wisdom is truly wise, and I need to know what it is, and when I find out what it is, that is going to lead my decision-making, period. God is generous in his wisdom, but he isn't wasting it on you. God's not inclined to say, well, let me tell you what I think. God is God. His wisdom is perfect. So he gives wisdom to people who really know they need his wisdom. So when we ask for wisdom, God says yes. The next one is in John chapter 14. Jesus is speaking to the disciples. This is the, the uh, upper room discourse. His last conversation before he gives his life for our sins. And he says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do and greater works than these he will do because I'm going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this is. I will do that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask me anything in my name, I will do it. Does anyone here routinely conclude their prayers with this expression, in Jesus' name we pray, amen? By the way, amen says, let it be so. like Captain Picard in Star Trek, make it so. That's amen. In Jesus, have you prayed using that expression, in Jesus' name I pray, amen? Is Jesus keeping his word? Whatever you ask in my name, I will do it. Have you asked some things in his name that you haven't seen done? I wonder if saying the words in Jesus' name is what he means. I guess not. Because I have seen many things prayed. In fact, I guess maybe most of the things I've seen prayed with that conclusion in Jesus' name, I pray. I guess I think most of the things I've seen prayed that way have not been done. I 
I guess there must be more to praying in Jesus' name than just that. Well, here's one thing I would notice about that. The only way I can pray at all is in Jesus' name. The only way I can come before God Almighty and expect Him to pay any attention at all is because of Christ and because I am in union with Christ in one sense or another. Because I belong to Christ, I'm invited to come boldly before the throne of grace and receive help in time of need. And if I'm not in Christ, then... I don't have any standing for praying at all. So one thing I would say is the only way I can pray is in Jesus' name. The other thing I would say is what does it mean to pray in someone's name? Well, here's what I think it means. When I was a kid, sometimes I would go to my little brother and I would say to my little brother, Mom says... You have to do this thing that I want done. Mom says you have to clean up our room. Now, what would determine whether my little brother would clean up our room if I said, Mom says? This is what would determine it. He would say, Mom, did you say... And what would determine his obedience to my command in Mom's name would be whether it was really her command. So when I come to God the Father and I say, in Jesus' name... It's like this. It's like what I'm saying is something like, and Jesus says so. I know if you ask Jesus, he'll agree with me that this ought to be. Oh. So to pray in Jesus' name the way we normally practice that all the time I think is fine because I, my standing to ask God for anything is in the name of Jesus. It's, it's because I'm related to Jesus that I can pray. And I can come and I can say, I'm standing here in Jesus' name asking for this. And yet what I'm asking for, I'm not sure I could say, and I know Jesus says so too. So there's... Uh, two different things going on here. In those occasions when I know Jesus says so too, I can say this confidently. And Jesus says, if you ask in my name anything, I'll do it. It does seem to me that if I'm going to ask something in Jesus' name, then I need to know what Jesus wants. If I go to my brother and I say, Mom says you have to clean up the dishes and I'm going outside to play, Mom says you have to, and if Mom really says that, then he really has to. But for me to say that to him, I need to know something about what she said. Well, or I could just be trying to trick him. But I'm not trying to trick him. She did say it, so I say what she said, and he has to obey. Well, that indicates that I know what she wants. So I'm skipping over one here in the outline because I decided they need to go in a different order. So we come to this one from 1 John chapter 5. First John chapter 5. 
verse 13. I write these things to you who believe in the name of the Son of God, that you may know that you have eternal life. And this is the confidence that we have toward him if we ask anything according to his will. If we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. And we know that, and if we know that he hears us in whatever we ask, we know that we have the request that we have asked of him. So if I know this is the will of God that I'm asking for, or the will of Jesus, if I know this is the will of Jesus and I'm asking for it, then I can ask for it in his name. And I can believe that it's actually going to be done. And we might gather together and agree because we know something about his will. And the more we trust this to be the will of God, the more confidence we might have when we ask. And so to ask in Jesus' name, I ought to know what Jesus wants, and so I ask according to his will. In James chapter 4, there's this interesting discussion about praying where James says, you know why you're fighting all the time, you Christians? You know why you're fighting all the time? Because you want stuff and someone else wants something and you want something and then you can't get what you want, so you fight all the time. And, but you know why you don't have what you want? Because you're not asking. Oh. And then he says, even when you do ask, you ask for the wrong reason. The wrong reason is just getting what you want. <laughs> to spend it on your own desires. Oh man, my promise is coming undone now because I said I was going to teach you how to manipulate God to get what you want. What you want might not be right and just getting what you want well God's God not you so I need to know something if I'm going to ask in Jesus name then I need to know something about what Jesus wants I need to ask according to his will so I need to know something about his will and if I'm just asking because it's what I want, then I, my expectation of just getting exactly that is likely to need to be revised. I don't know if you've had this experience. Have you had this experience when you, uh, you're praying and you're praying and you're praying and there's something you really think you need from God and God should give it to you and you pray and you pray and you pray and you pray, you might even pray for years and then a later you're praying for something kind of like that but not exactly that. Hmm. We should ask according to his will. Then God says yes. Well, that just makes perfect sense, does it not? If I ask you for something you want to give me, what are you going to say? Yes. If we ask God for what he wants, he's going to say yes. And that very text in James that we talked about says indicates to us that sometimes he's just waiting for us to ask he's saying you don't have it because you're not asking hmm ask ask if I'm going to ask in Jesus name then I want to know what Jesus wants and then I can ask according to his will and how will I know what he wants how do I know what he wants well there's a little clue in John chapter 15 where we have another one of these statements 
This is the passage about abiding in the vine, you know? I'm the vine, you're the branches. That passage. And in the middle of that, in verse 7, he says this, if you abide in me, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you. Oh. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you want. I just think it's stunning that Jesus says stuff like this. Whatever you wish. Really? But this is the condition. If you abide in me and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. By this, my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit and so prove to be my disciples. Oh, so I want to know what he wants to pray according to his will, to pray in his name, to agree with you, to pray together in his name, especially for the wisdom we need to confront whatever situation we find ourselves in and to have some confidence that he will provide it. How, does I, how do I get there? I abide in him and his words abide in me. I walk in fellowship with Christ in his word. And then I start to become familiar with what he wants and therefore what I can ask really in his name with some confidence and uh, agree together with you about it and because we can see it right here in the word of God and we pray and we believe because well, we're just asking for what he said he wants to give us. We ask according to his will when we abide in Christ and his words abide in us. I find my life in Christ and his words find their life in me. The word of God is like the sap of the vine. So Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. What's the source? How does, how does the vine communicate to the branches through the sap, which is the truth of Christ, the word of the scriptures, the truth of the gospel. And so that becomes infused into my life. That changes how I see the world around me, what I think is needed. I'm less likely to think, hey, let's just manipulate God into giving us something we think would be fantastic to have, and more in the lines of what is God seeking to accomplish through the ministry of the branches that are so intimately connected to the life of Christ? That is a really different sort of question. And th now I'm looking around to see what is the opportunity for bearing the image of God into this situation. I'm looking to bring goodness and the goodness of God. This reminds me of that whole outline that we've looked at in Philippians where Paul prays that the Spirit would work in us so that Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith. That's abiding in Him. That Christ would dwell in our hearts through faith. That being rooted and grounded in love, we are transformed into a different sort of person with a different sort of outlook that looks at the needs around them in a different way. that might even see some value in my enduring some suffering for the love of someone else. I might, instead of praying, God, make me rich, or God, heal my body, or God, blah, 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 whatever I think I might want, I start to pray, God, 
help me endure for the sake of my friend. Like Jesus, not my will, but thine be done. I ask according to his will. There's one more. It's in 1 John chapter 3. Verse 21. Beloved, if our heart does not condemn us, we have confidence before God. Oh, that's where we started. Confidence before God. If we believe we have confidence before God and whatever we ask, we receive from Him because, because we keep His commandments and do what pleases Him. God says yes when we keep His commandments doing what pleases Him. I look at it like this. God says yes when God can trust you. When God can trust you to bear His image for His glory, then whatever it is you're asking for, He's happy to give. Now, I'm troubled by this talk that I've just given you. I'm really troubled. Because what I've just given you is a big old list of stuff you ought to do. I don't even like that kind of talk. Usually, I think, if I went to some church and the pastor gave the talk that I just gave you, it would probably make me mad. Because I think what I've just done to you is lay upon you a heavy burden. That's not the gospel. Now the gospel is God is good and God will provide and he will do so in some measure in response to your prayers. But God is gracious. And the way I've just stated this, I, sa I said something like this, God will say yes to your prayers when you do what He commands. Well, that, I think, might encourage you to go try to do what He commands. But it's fortunate for us that in Christ, His commands are fulfilled already on your behalf. So we need to try to reposition all of these things into the gospel. And here's what I would say. Here's how I would summarize that. When you talk to God... The one who changes is you, not God. That prayer is an opportunity for God to, to mold us. And I come to God in Christ, as I've said already. I come to God in Christ. And I can come to God... I know I've said I said this last Sunday. I can ask him for whatever I want. The only thing I need to know in order to pray is what do I want? Is that a somehow a contradiction of what we're looking at here to this morning? I don't think so. Because what God does is provide for us completely and especially in prayer. The scripture says that the Son of God ever lives to make intercession for us. So whether I pray or not, he's praying. He's always praying. 
and his prayer is always something like this. Oh, he's with me. And so he's okay. And I am safe in Christ, so I can come, the scripture says in that same context, boldly before the throne of grace to get help. And so this motto, I could think, I can work on it. How do, am I asking for what God, what's like the heart of God already? That's a good thing to look for and search for. And as I pray, the Lord might mold my heart in that direction, and that would be good. That would be God doing me a big favor. But I can just come and say, here's what I want, Lord. But then I can trust Him. I can trust in the Son of God interceding for me. Oh, and there's another person interceding for me, which I could read about in Romans chapter 8, where the scripture says that I don't know how to pray. Paul says this. The Apostle Paul, St. Paul, says, we don't know what we should pray for. But God has provided. Now, could I learn a little better how, what I should pray for? Yes. That'd be a good idea. I might want to think, is this according to God's will that I'm asked? I used to ask the youth group when I was a youth pastor, I used to say, they'd share some prayer requests, and I would say to them, why would God want to give you that? What? How would God get interested in what you're asking for? I think that's a really good question. But I wouldn't say, don't ask until you know for sure. I'd say, just bring it. You know God's taking care of you. He, he'll, he'll manage. And the scripture says, it, with reference to the Spirit, when we pray in our ill-informed way when we don't know what to ask and we ask anyway the spirit intercedes for us according to God's will you know you have never prayed a single prayer in your whole life that did not fulfill this commission this condition when we ask according to his will because the spirit takes all your prayers and fits them to that condition. Now, you might not recognize it after he does that. You might be asking for this, and what you get is this, because the Spirit has interceded. When you talk to God, though, the one that changes is you. As you look through this whole process, you think, well, if I could just believe... And then you think, well, how could I do that? Well, I need to know in order to believe. And I need you to agree, and that's one way we get to know. And I need wisdom, which I lack. And I know God is a reliable source. And I ask in Jesus' name, meaning I'm saying, I think I know something about what Jesus would want. And I abide in Christ and his words abide in me and so I am molded and transformed and changed and I ask then according to his will and then I'm the sort of person that reliably keeps his commandments and so his, my prayers become oriented toward that. And then he's inclined. What's changed? Me. Me. What's changed is me. The Word of God and the Spirit of God have operated in my life as I prayed. As I prayed my ill-informed prayers, my prayers become more informed. So when you talk to God, the one who changes is you. And you do need to change, so I suggest you begin to pray. Because as you pray, you will be changed. And the fact that you are praying is the biggest deal of all. It, is, it matters more than any of this other discussion. The fact that you are praying is more significant than anything you might pray about. 
for heaven's sake, you are allowed to talk to God. So I might come into prayer thinking, now how can I get God to do what I want? And you know what? God understands that that, that was where you started. I might come into prayer thinking, how can I get God to do what I want? In fact, that's how I come into prayer most of the time. I want something and God could give it to me. God, give it to me. And I have something real specific in mind. And as I pray, I might have to think about, well, why would God get interested in that? And how, why would he give me that? And what might he give me instead of that? And what would Jesus actually want? And if I'm working on following him and being his disciple and abiding in him and his words abiding in me, do I still want that? I'm getting changed. I'm getting changed. God is in his grace operating in my life moving me from the one who wants to manipulate him to the one he can rely on to bear his image in the world. That's a blessing. Father, thank you for the word of God, for the way it addresses our lives. Lord, help us to dwell in it. We ask for the ministry of the Spirit in the grace of God in Christ. Lord, that these things aren't a burden to us or a, some sort of source of manipulation, but a source of blessing. That the grace of God in Christ would work out in us. And we thank you for that. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you.